we are going back to the foundation of the faith. And we will begin with salvation. Do not underestimate this topic. Because it may sound very basic, but you will be surprised at the explosive content of the revelation that is to be found in this word salvation. We begin with the word salvation. The verb of Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua, which is exactly the name of our Savior. His name is the noun, common noun, made into a proper noun. Yeshua means salvation. God is our salvation. The root word is the verb Yasha, which means to be saved, to be liberated, to be freed, to rescue, to win victory too. But the noun is Yeshua. I will uh, tighten this concept as we go along. But please take note that the name of our Savior, the one that we call Jesus, is in Hebrew. It is directly, completely meaning salvation. In the Hebraic Bible, salvation is always connected with God. Salvation is never connected with what you do. Never connected with a ceremony you perform. Never connected with a good work you do. The concept of salvation is always connected to God. I'll just give you a sample because there are hundreds of them all over the Bible. Psalm 38, 22. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burden, the God who is our salvation. O God of our salvation, deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. The salvation concept is always connected with God. Apart from God, there is no salvation. That's the Hebraic root concept. God of my salvation. I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. Exodus 15 two. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise Him. My Father's God and I will extol Him. Behold, God is my salvation. Isaiah twelve two. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. Psalm 62.1 My soul waits in silence for God only. From Him is my salvation. From Him. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. He is our salvation. Psalm 145 verse 19 He will fulfill the desire of those who fear Him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord is is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. I can give you some more of this, but there are just so many, hundreds of this in, all over the scripture. He delivers and rescues, Daniel 6. Habakkuk 3.18 I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Why? Salvation is to be found only in God. The name salvation is connected with God himself. On this first introductory point, immediately do not look at anything and anybody else as the source of your salvation. It does not belong to a church. does not belong to a denomination. A denomination cannot save. A church cannot save. A ceremony, a prayer cannot save. God only can save. You shall call His name Yeshua, for it is He who will save his people from their sins. And here is Acts 4.12. I hope that we will memorize this forever and ever. Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Isaiah 43. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he, before me, there was no God formed. There will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And apart from me, there is no Savior. All this teaching about co-Savior, co-Redeemer, that is, that is wrong. It insults the Lord. The Lord is completely the Savior. He doesn't need help. 
He alone saves. There is no other Savior. Let's be strict on that. There is no nobody else. He is not 97% Savior for which 3% will come in by way of help from another person. He is the only Savior. There is no other Savior. Now, if that is how big the word salvation is, that it only God can be our salvation, that means it must be a very big thing, then we are going to be saved from what? What are the dangers do we need to be saved from? This is a very basic question. For a proper understanding, we need to go back to the Torah. Now, you might ask, why go to the Torah or Genesis when the concept of salvation is a very New Testament concept? Please remember the discussion between Jesus or Yeshua and Nicodemus. This is the 1998 scriptures, which is uh, Hebraic. So, there was a man of the Pharisees, Nacdemon or Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Yehudim, of the Jews. And he came to Yeshua by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher, come from Elohim, for no one is able to do these things you do if Elohim is not with him. Yeshua answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born from above, or born again in some translations, he is unable to see the kingdom or the reign of Elohim, the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus said to him, How is a man able to be born again when he is old? Is he able to enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Yeshua answered, Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he is unable to enter into the reign of Elohim. And then he explains about flesh, giving birth to flesh, spirit to spirit. And he said, Do not marvel that I said to you, you have to be born from above. The Spirit breathes where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who has been born the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said to him, How is it possible for this to take place? Now, take note of the answer of Yeshua. Are you the teacher of Israel, and you do not know this? You are a teacher of Israel. Your Bible is the Old Testament, I'm talking to you about being reborn, about eternal life. I'm talking to you about seeing the kingdom of God. And you do not know what I'm talking about. Yeshua expected those who study the Old Testament to see the doctrine of salvation there. The doctrine of salvation is Old Testament in origin explained and amplified and clarified only in the New Testament. The foundation is in the Old Testament. Now, what this means is that it's not a New Testament teaching, salvation. The foundation for this is in the Old Testament and we need to go back to Genesis. Now, Genesis is very familiar, but I want you to pretend as if you have not heard of it before. Look at it from an entirely different point of view, from a different perspective. And watch out closely for the backdrop for which salvation is being introduced. Because salvation does not just come in without a backdrop or a background. There's a reason why salvation came into the picture. There was a problem that arose for which salvation is needed. So we need to look at the background carefully. And we need to look at the sovereignty and power of God, the plan of God, the goodness of God, the instruction of God, for which salvation later on became a necessity because something happened. Okay, Genesis 1, the sovereignty and power of God. In the beginning, Elohim created. Look at the power of Elohim. He created the heavens and the earth from the root word bara which means to make something out of nothing. Elohim is so powerful that it is his expertise and specialization to make something out of nothing. So if you think you have nothing, praise the Lord because Elohim 
can display his ability to make something out of nothing. You have no money, you have nothing, you have no future, so that nothing, you have no joy, no peace, that is the expertise of Elohim. He is good at making something out of nothing. And then, the earth was formless and empty, and the spirit of Elohim was hovering on the face of the waters. The word hovering is the word that is used for chicken or hen that is uh, going to hatch her eggs. That's hovering. And Elohim said, let light come to be. All he did was to speak. The word of Elohim is very powerful. Okay, that's basic. And then he said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. That was the plan of Elohim, to make man in our image and likeness. What is the difference between image and likeness? They are basically the same, but there are distinctions that we can appreciate. Image is reflection. Likeness is function. We carry the image of God, so we represent Him. We reflect Him. And we are made in His likeness, like Him creating. So we create, not out of nothing, but out of the thing that has already been made by God. He governs, so we govern. He takes care, so we take care. So there's a reflection and a function, the image and the likeness. That was the plan of Elohim. And this is expressed by ruling over creation. Man is asked to rule. He is asked to rule, given the, the, the job of ruling. And when he rules, he is blessed. The Lord gave him not only a mandate, but also an anointing and a blessing to bear fruit to increase, to fill the earth, to subdue it, and rule over. And then He gave us everything that we need. And when Elohim saw all that He has made, behold, it was very good. How were we created? Just a quick review. Elohim formed our body from the dust of the earth, and then He breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, that is our spirit, and we became a living soul. So body, spirit, and soul. We will discuss that in the further series of salvation. Because the body needs to be saved. The spirit has to be saved. The soul has to be saved. The whole salvation process redeems the body, the soul, and the spirit. So we will talk about that later on. Okay, now, the instruction of God was, for the man to work and to guard the garden. The word garden is very important. This is the background that leads to the tragedy of sin. The tragedy of sin. For which salvation is needed. You know what is the meaning of the word garden? The Hebrew word for garden is gan, G-A-N, which means enclosure. Enclosure. Our place of intimacy. In the garden of Eden, God and man were communing were having intimate relationship, bonding, communicating. That was the one violated. Adam and Eve did not guard the garden, did not guard the relationship. And in that uh, garden, Elohim commanded the man, eat of every tree of the garden, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall certainly die. In the day that you eat of it, you shall certainly die. Now, here is the backdrop for salvation that is beginning to appear more clearly. A threat of death. I give you everything, but this one thing you must not do. Because if you do it, you will die. You will die. Adam has never seen death, never heard of death, has no prior experience of death. But the Lord warned him, if you do it, you will die. Okay? So, every tree is God's goodness to us. We are free, except 
for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the only one tree that symbolizes a test of man's respect, submission, and obedience to God. Don't eat of it. In the middle of the garden, to test man's respect, submission, and obedience to God. Okay. What is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? The word knowledge is from the root word, the ath which means knowledge or skill coming from experience. Good is tobe, which means pleasant or right. Evil is ra, meaning wicked, immoral, bad, or disagreeable. Here is what the Apostle Paul, thousands of years later, said, speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit, concerning knowledge of good and evil. And I hope young people listen to this. Please listen and put your attention to this. Make this your constitution and bylaws. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. Be excellent at what is good. Be innocent about what is evil. You will be tempted by your neighbors and friends to experience smoking, premarital sex, drugs. Just for you to have an experience. Charge to experience. Para lang nga maka-experience ka. Para lang nga hindi ka magmanul. Tilawi lang ni, just try this. That is exactly the Garden of Eden testing all over again, repeated all the way up to now. Tilawi lang bala, just try. Just a little bit of knowledge of this and that. The promise of the Lord for those who are excellent at what is good and innocent about what is evil is that Satan will soon be crushed under their feet. If they keep at being excellent at what is good, be innocent at what is evil. So, now Satan enters the picture. Here is now the scenario for which salvation became a necessity. Satan means adversary or oppositor. That's what the meaning of the word Satan is. He opposes everything that God does. His uh, job is just to oppose. He will oppose the sovereignty and power of God. He will oppose the goodness of God. He will oppose the plan of God. He will oppose the instruction of the word of God. His objective is cause, to cause people to sin. What is sin? The word sin is Chata, which means simply to miss. It doesn't mean wicked or evil or vile. It just means to miss. Not, it just means not to hit the mark. If this is God's will, just go here and there and there. That's already sin. If the Lord wants it here, then it should be here. Anything that is not here is sin. That is what is chata. Just to miss. So, do not think of the word sin as a very bad word. Any will of God that we do not pursue according to His expectation is sin. Transgression is pesha, which is rebellion. So, Satan wants us to miss and then to rebel. Now, how did he do it? Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was more crafty. Young people, listen. Even as older people. The approach of Satan is craftiness. It's not terrorism. He will not appear to you like a demon in the dead of the night. Maybe sometimes there are occasions like that. But he has scored more victories with craftiness. Being wise. Being tanda. Being seductive, being beautiful, being attractive, not being terrible, not being kaladlukan. Satan has brought more people to hell by being sexy, attractive, because he is crafty. He got Adam and Eve by craftiness, not by power play, but by by trickery and cunning and deception. How did he do it? Look at, look at his style. He is, in a sense, very smart. 
Look at what he said. He said to the woman, Is it true that Elohim has said, Do not eat of every tree of the garden? He just planted a very little seed of doubt. Just this question, Is it true? Is, is it really true? Is it true that you have to forgive all those who have hurt you? Is it really true that you must uh, bless those who curse you? Is it really true? At tuod gitna nga may Red Sea. Was there really a crossing of the Red Sea? Look, you go to colleges, universities, even those religious universities and colleges, because they will throw at you all questions of, is it true that, that uh, Joshua, when he reached the Jordan River, the river parted, is it really true that when they went around Jericho six times, seven times, the walls collapsed? Is it really true? Just this simple question. Is it true that Elohim has said, so a doubt was created. At first, the woman was quite good. He said, she said, we are to eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, do not eat it, nor touch it, lest you die. The Lord never said, do not touch it. He just said, do not eat. So you are already seeing the dynamics of playing around with the word of God. The word of God is first doubted. Then the word of God is distorted. Then it ended up, the word of God is denied or disobeyed. You shall certainly not die. Tatlo malang ginini ka trickery. Doubt, distort, and disobey. But he doubts, he starts with doubt. Should young people keep themselves sexually pure before marriage? Komo naman ayan, subong niya, kaya iti experience mo. Mayo gani, it will even be good if you go into marriage with some experience in the past so because you will be wise. Why is it really true that virginity is important? Is, is it really true? Amo gina, the same. The same lang gina it, Satan has never really changed. He is the same in his tactic. Sometimes he sends you to philosophy class to very high expensive schools and then he bombards you creating doubt about then he says oh the bible is full of contradiction is it true that the bible is the word of god oh it just contains the word of god but it is not the word of god so he is over at it again for elohim knows that in the day you eat of it satan now ups the ante your eyes shall be opened and you shall be like elohim knowing good and evil i want you to see the attack of Satan, and how big a problem that he created for which salvation is needed to remedy it. Look at what he did. Satan attacked the goodness of God by intrigue. Intriga. Elohim knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes shall be opened and you will be like him. He suggested that Elohim is jealous does not want his children to enjoy life. Does not want his children to be at par with him. He is keeping something from them. I, the Lord, you know, God prohibited you from touching it or from eating of it because, you know, this God, he does not want you to be like him. So, for a moment, Eve started to think, yeah, no, why, why would God, He gave us already everything, but this one, He denied us. Is God killjoy? He puts a limit to the pleasure that we have in life. Oh, I want to discover some more. I want to go to that place. Oh, my mom said I cannot go there, but I just want to check it out. I just want to experience. For my experience, man, Balaku. Huh. Okay. So, he started this, and that is what he is doing all over the world. Why did God allow starving in Africa? Why is there AIDS? Why did he allow Yolanda? Where was God? So, he begins to attack the goodness of God. Why did he allow cancer? Why did he? Then you begin to doubt. No, ni man. Is God really good? Oh, siling ni Brother Butch, God is good all the time. 
all the time, God is good. But the moment we doubt the goodness of God, we are sitting back for satanic operation. So, that is what he did. And the woman, because of suspicion and doubt, I want you to look at these dynamics. The same dynamics, it has not changed. The world is still operating this way. She saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. And she took of its fruit and she ate. First, you have to see silang anay, tanaw, tanaw. Wow. Then touching, touching. Are you following? Then eating, eating. Okay. That it starts with what we see, and then we start to. That is true with everything. Everything. Whether drugs, sex, uh, luxury that is out of place, it always starts with seeing, desiring, touching, touching. Buying, buying, and getting, getting. So, that is what, okay? So, I am not suggesting anything. I am just saying that let the Lord guide us in everything that we do, including our shopping and spending. So, seeing, teaching, eating. That's how it works. Now, remember First John, the three descriptions of fleshliness and sin. There is lust of the flesh, Lust of the eyes and pride of life. That is what Eve experienced. Lust of the flesh because she said the tree was good for food. Lust of the eyes because she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. And pride of life because it was desirable for gaining wisdom. This is not from the Father. This is from the world. So, itong, this is very sad about the husband. All the time, what was Adam doing while Satan was tempting Eve? She was watching and not making any comment. She, uh, he, I mean he, was there all the time. Why? Because Genesis 3, 6b said, she gave to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Why did Adam not comment? And not intercept. Because Adam was interested to see if Eve would die. <laughs> if she dies, she will, he will have another wife. <laughs> this is what happened. He, she gave to her husband who was with her. The problem of uh, physically present, but morally and spiritually absent. Not assuming command of the family. It will create problems. As it happened in the early times. So the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew what they, and they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loin coverings for themselves. Now, sewing fig leaves together and making loin coverings for themselves is the representation of all the human attempt to cover sin. The problem with our attempt to cover sin is that it is itchy, it withers, it dries up the leaves, it is very precarious, you cannot play football with this kind of attire. <laughs> the penalty area will be rebuilt if you move too much. So, And it is inadequate, it just cannot Cover. This is the effort of human beings to cover their sin. Okay. And so, the Lord, uh, they heard the sound of Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of Elohim among the trees of the garden, and Elohim called unto Adam and said, Where are you? And the answer was, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Hiding, being afraid, and being ashamed is the result of sin. When people hide, when people are afraid, when people are ashamed, usually it is because they are living in sin. So the effects of sin is separation from God, disfellowship, loss of intimacy, fear and shame, hiding from God. We do, we think we do a good job of hiding, suing fig leaves, 
by appearing all right, by driving the flashiest cars, by looking very terrific, by all these other uh, attires and get up, by engaging into parties that conceal our brokenness, our confusion, our depression, our anxiety, our worry. We are still doing the Adamic thing of covering up our shame. But it is not working. Soon they were blaming each other. He said, Who made you know that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you? The man blamed his wife. Oh, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. I want you to notice the thinking of sinful mind before we go into the need for salvation so that we can come to the Lord in desperation. Lord, help me, Lord. I do not want to be like that. Look at this. The woman whom you gave to be with me. He was blaming God. Tagaan mo pa ko asawa? For sang una, when he was alone, playing with the elephants and the deer, he felt lonely. And the Lord gave him a wife. And when he woke up, he said, Wow, man! So that's why it was, she was called a woman. Wow, man! But now, <laughs> oh, oh, you! So he blamed God. God, it is your fault. Oh, and this is what we do today. God, it is your fault because I come from a dysfunctional family. God, it is your fault because you gave me a drunk card for a father. God, it is your fault because my mother never did anything except play mahjong from 2 o'clock in the morning up to 12.30 in the evening. So that is why I am like this. So you ask me, why am I like this? It's your fault. You gave me a terrible family. You gave me a bad husband. You gave me a poor mother. And you gave me a, a drug addict for a teenage, for a son or a daughter. It is your fault. You. Oh. Because the job that I applied for, you did not give to me. So, why am I living in sin? It's because of you. Exactly what Adam did. The, the whole dynamics of sinfulness is blame game. Okay. And Elohim said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. The woman was more honest than the man. This was correct. The serpent deceived me. Although she should have not been deceived. But she said, the serpent deceived me. And so Elohim said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed and there, there is enmity between you and the woman, which you will take up some other time because of the prophecy of the coming of a seed that will crush the head of the serpent. But here is the effect of the sin. I will greatly increase your sorrow and your conception to the woman and your desire is for your husband and he will rule over you. So many Bible scholars have tried to interpret what in the world is this trying to say. The, the, the psychologists have an explanation for this. I do not know if the women here will accept this but this is how they interpret it. If a woman is impregnated by a man that she becomes the mother of the child of the man. There is an unusual bonding towards that man, even if she is suffering from that man, which is the uh, phenomenon of a uh, battered wife. Why would many women not leave abusive male partners? They said it might be because of this. Well, I don't know, but that's for you to think about. And to the man, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. The issue here is not so much listening to your wife as not listening to God. You can listen to your wife, but the moment you know that it is not according to God, you should be able to stand your ground. So curse is the ground because of you. Please take note that God did not curse man. He cursed the ground. Okay, And then he said... For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now, here is the coming in of salvation. Did not God say, if you eat of it, you will surely die? 
nobody among them died. In the day that you eat of it, you shall, you shall certainly die. What day? Di ba? Evening and morning, the first day. Evening and morning, the second day. And Adam did not die. The Bible even says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. So, where is the danger from which we need salvation? From which we need to be saved? Otherwise, salvation will just be a topic, will just be a concept. There has to be a necessity for salvation. What is this danger that we need to be saved from? God said, you will certainly die. Did the word of God come true? Adam did not die on the day he disobeyed. That's what we think. Remember what the Lord said. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. How old was Adam when he died? All the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. He did not reach one day because one day is a thousand years. He just lived up to 900 years. 30 years. He died. So Adam died on the day he ate. Because one day to the Lord is a thousand and a thousand is one day. Now, there are several kinds of death. This death is the thing that which, that, well, which necessitates our being saved. Many people believe in God. You ask a man on the street, do you believe in God? Yes. Are you saved? What? What saved? Saved? Saved about what? Saved from what? I have a savings account, but what, what do you mean saved? No. Many people do not understand salvation or being saved because they don't know the danger. Danger number one, spiritual death. When God asked Adam, where are you? There was already spiritual death, separation from God. Even though we are alive, if we have no relationship with God because of sin, we are already spiritually dead. Colossians 2.13 When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. We were dead. We are dead in transgressions and sins. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. As you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. If we are spiritually dead, whether we like it or not, we are under the prince of the power of the air. That is Satan. Huh? Why, I'm not cooperating with Satan, yeah? Grabe ka naman niya, why you, you make issue out of... Sobra ka naman niya mag-intriga. Me? Working with Satan? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Yes, ma'am. The Bible says, Anyone who is dead in trespasses and sins lives according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who is working in the sons of disobedience. Is that so? So what is my destiny? What is the danger that I'm facing? The Bible says, you are by nature children of wrath. You are waiting for wrath to happen. Huh? What do you mean wrath? Why man kuya naga pang lugos ya? Why man? Ako yung gabulik pa ko ganit kay nana. I'm helping my mother. I'm helping. I'm very helpful. Are you saved? I don't know. Oh. So? So what if I don't know? Well, because those who are not saved, they are objects of wrath. Wrath is coming upon them. And this is what many people do not understand, for which salvation is not appreciated. Look at what the Bible says, Proverbs 8.36. He who sins against me endures himself. All those who hate me love death. When Adam sinned, death came into the world and death spread to all men because all have sinned. And death reigned from Adam until Moses. Now, spiritual death. The second death is physical death. When you are spiritually dead, 
no relationship with God, and you physically die, which everybody, you know, uh, in this world will experience, some, unless Jesus comes or Yeshua comes before it's our time. Here is the big problem. If a man dies physically in his state of spiritual death, his spiritual death becomes what is known as second death or eternal death. This is the real danger. The big time danger. Why? Because the second death is going to hell. Revelations 2.11 He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. And what is the second death? The second death is being thrown in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. How long is the second death? Eternal. Huh? Eternal? Yes. Eternal punishment. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. I am getting ahead of myself, but I am being stirred up by the Lord. You know what is so bad about hell? Listen carefully, my dear brothers and sisters, so that we will check our salvation and begin to earnestly desire the salvation of our loved ones. Listen to this. Hell is a place where there is no love of God. Listen to this. Hell is a place where there is no love of God. Do you see the love of God everywhere around you? The air that you breathe, the sun that rises, the food that you eat, that's the love of God. You drink water, that's the love of God. You have a friend who hugs you, that's the love of God. A child that kisses you, that's the love of God. But there is a place where there is no more love of God. That is hell. There is nowhere that you will feel even just one bit of the love of God. Can you imagine living a place where there is no love of God? That is hell. That is the danger that we are all facing because of sin. Jutai, jutai, lang tunga, seeing, seeing, touching, touching, eating, eating. This is the danger. What is hell like? It's a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This topic is not popular because this is not being preached in the churches. Nobody preaches hell. I give you a shocker. You count in your concordance the number of times Yeshua taught about heaven and the number of times He taught about hell the number of times he talked about hell is twice as many as the number of times he talked about heaven. He spoke more about hell than about heaven. You check your Torah, Deuteronomy 28. 11 or 12 verses of blessing, 24 verses of cursing. Twice. He spoke more about the danger of judgment than the blessing of being saved. And this is not being preached. This is not being emphasized. The weeping and gnashing of teeth. Revelations chapter 20. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. The death and hate gave up the dead that were in them. And the death and hate were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Now, I want us to look at the rich man and Lazarus as we go into the solution to this problem that is so terrible. This is, to me, a fantastic story that Yeshua told. You know the rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day? And there was Lazarus covered with sores, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table? Okay, look at the next verses. This is really terrific. The time came. I want you to absorb that in your spirit. The time came. A time will come when it is time to say goodbye. Some of us, as young people, you 
are full of energy. But I want you to be respectful towards the shortness of life. Life is short. Time will come. When the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died. This is mentioned by the great Bible commentators as the great equalizer, the great also. The rich will also die. The famous will also die. The drug lords will also die. Because the time will come upon all. It depends on whether you are in Christ or not in Christ. Now, when the rich man died, the description of the scriptures in Hades, or the abode of the dead, he was in torment. And he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Some people commit suicide because they think I want to end it all. Because I cannot bear the problem of this world. And they have not read the Bible that in the next life, if you are not in Christ, you will be in torment and you will be in agony because the fire is real in that place. And he was just asking for one drop of water. But here is the next word that is so gut-wrenching. Son, remember. I want you to absorb this word. Remember. He was already in Hades, the abode of the dead, in torment. He can remember. It is possible to remember. You will remember your name. You will remember your relatives. You will remember your elementary days. You will remember how you were invited to a Bible study and you never came. You will remember how you threw away the Gideon Bible that was given to you when you were in high school. You will remember everything in hell. You remember that in your lifetime, you receive your good things. While Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place. A great divide, a great canal. So that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He cannot come here to bring a glass of water. He cannot also have five minutes of break there and come back. No, cannot be. It's all over. It's all over. It's eternal. It's everlasting. So he answered the rich man, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. You will remember that you have brothers. You will remember your classmates. Your first cousin you will remember and your auntie, whom you did not share the gospel with. You will remember them all. You will remember them in hell. Adam replied, Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So from this we learn, your condition on earth does not determine your condition in the next life. How you live here, you live here in a flashy subdivision, you live in an air-conditioned room, just because that's how you live here, you think that is how you'll be in the next life? Disabuse your thinking. The condition here on earth does not determine your condition in the next life. Hell is a place of torment. Torment. Torture. It's a bad place. If you want to commit suicide in order to end it all, don't. You are just beginning the torment in hell. Hell is a place where there is no more love of God. Not even a drop of water can be given to you. Not even one drop. There is nobody who will give you chicken joy or spaghetti. 
There is nobody. Not even a drop of water. It is a place of memories. You will remember everything. You cannot drink medicine to help you forget. No, there is no medication there to help you forget. You will remember everything. And hell is a permanent place. Now, please allow me to say this with all the love of God. There is nothing more that can be done for you when you are in hell. No prayers from the earth can transfer you from this place to the next. You better decide here what you want, where you want to be. You cannot say, Pidi man ko makapang torpe kag lampingas kay panghadian malang ko na nila ma istorya malang na ang ginoo. The Bible is very clear. Abraham said, "I'm sorry. A great chasm has been fixed between you and them. They cannot go here. You cannot go there. I cannot even bring you one drop of water." No more prayers can be made for you if you find yourself in hell, in Hades. No more. You do all your praying here on earth. Hell is permanent. Now, are you sure, brother, that we cannot negotiate on earth for the souls of those in the next life? I want you to remember Psalm 49, verses 6 to 8. Let the Bible answer that question. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches, no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for his soul. For the redemption of his soul is costly. No payment is ever enough. That is why you better talk to your children if they are not in the Lord. You better talk. You better pray hard for them that they will come to the saving knowledge of Yeshua HaMashiach. If your parents are not in the Lord, you better cry out to the Lord for them. Because once it's goodbye, it's over. There is nothing more that can be done. Abram's advice. I cannot send Lazarus back to earth. Let them listen to Moses and the prophet. The word Moses and the prophet represents the word and they all point to Christ. So everything goes back to the word of God. Now, who are going to hell? We think the Maote and the Estafador. The first two are very interesting mentioned in Revelation 21.8. For the cowardly and the unbelieving are classmates of murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Ha? Huh? Cowardly and unbelieving will be will have their part in the lake that burns with fire, which is the second death. What is cowardly? The word cowardly is the Greek word diilos, which means timid or fearful. And unbelieving is apistos, without trust, untrusting, not will to believe. You know what, what this means? Those who are hesitant to check the truth, because they are afraid that there might be disturbance in their family and social standing. Ay, amuna ko niya, magamu pa ni karun kun magsagay ko di usisa ni kun ano ni. Dako niya nga gamu niya, hindi na lang bala pag gamu ha. Ay, hala. Madula na iya ang iridar ko ya. You will not make a stand. You will not be willing to check the facts just because you have been with that system ever since you were born. You will not make a stand and say, Pa, I'm really sorry for disappointing you. I do not mean to. But I have found the truth that Yeshua is my Savior. I want to give my life to Him. Those who will not make a stand, those who will be ashamed, those who will not venture in boldness of faith, 
will have their share in the burning lake of fire that is the second death. This is not my word. This is the scriptures. What is hell like? Yeshua describing it. Mark chapter 9. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That is why we need salvation. That is why we need the Savior. And only God can save us from hell. If there is no hell, there is no need for salvation. If there is no hell, there is no need for repentance. Why, why are we wasting our time here in Nihop if there is no hell? Let's party. Let's paint the town red. There is a hell as there is a heaven. Now, here is salvation. How did God now provide salvation? Because of the danger of hell. The danger of the second death. The danger of eternal punishment. In the book of Genesis, it is very simply mentioned. But the disturbance that it created in the cosmos is not even displayed here. God is so humble and so good. This is just a one line that he made when he revealed to Moses the beginnings of our history. Elohim made coats of skin for the man and his wife and dressed them. But I want you to understand this. Before this time, there was no animal that has ever been killed in God's creation. No knife ever slashed a throat. All the angels were watching. And Hamashiach, Yeshua Hamashiach was watching. And Yeshua understood that a few thousand years from now, it will be done to him. And he was watching. The angels knew that Yeshua would be that animal and they were all watching in silence. When the father killed the first innocent animal. Brutal process. Bloody process. Gory process. Why? Because he who eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will surely die. The Lord said somebody will die. So, Elohim made coats of skin because the fig leaves could not cover up the shame of man. An animal was slaughtered. He had no fault. Just to cover up for the foolishness of man. The sinfulness of man. And it did not happen once. The whole idea was to point to Christ someday. That as the innocent sacrifice... He will clothe us with His skin of righteousness. This whole idea is because the wages of sin is death. Therefore, there is also no salvation apart from someone paying the price of death. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And, this was what Yeshua expected Nicodemus to know. Nicodemus, did you not read in Leviticus that everything has to be purified with blood? Did it not occur to you to ask the question, whose blood will I partake of so that 
there will be remission or forgiveness of my sins. This was what the psalmist in Psalm 49, 6-8 said, No man can redeem the soul of his brother because the ransom is too costly. You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Nobody can pay this. There is no ransom for the soul of a man that we can give. Only the blood of Christ. The lamb that was slain points to Christ. Had Nicodemus only read Isaiah 53, he would have asked the question, Master, Rabbi, who was he who was despised and rejected by man? A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Who is that? Had he only read the Old Testament as that was his only Bible at that time. Yeshua expected Nicodemus to ask about this. Who was it who was pierced for our transgression? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. Who? Who is this guy? Look at the rendition of the Message Bible, modern English. Isaiah 57-9. He was beaten, he was tortured, he did not say a word. Like a lamb taken to be slaughtered, and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried, and he was led off. And did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare, beaten bloody for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with a rich man, even though he never hurt a soul or said one word that wasn't true. Nicodemus never got it at the time. What was the effects of the sin? Elohim sent out uh, Adam and Eve, drove them out, and this was an act of mercy so that they will not become immortal if they eat of the tree of uh, life. If they ate of the tree of life, then they would have been sure to go to hell forever because there can be no more remedy if they are already immortal. So, God continued to reiterate the shedding of blood as the only solution to sin. When Cain and Abel, the children of Adam and Eve, was brought into the world, they brought offerings to the Lord. Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portion. Ibig sabihin, if you offer fat, fat portion, that means you killed a lamb, you killed an animal. Because you cannot get the fat portion if you do not kill it. What happened? The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, respect for Abel and his offering. But Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Why? Because Cain never understood the blood atonement. He never understood the shedding of blood. The Lord was looking at Cain, the eldest, and he was shaking his head. He never got it. He think he could appease my holiness by giving me durian and mangustin. The only thing that saved his mother and father was when I killed a lamb. I'm looking for it again. Where is the lamb that was slain? He never got it. Only Abel the younger got it. So he offered. And further reiterated for the nation, many years later in Israel when they were coming out of Egypt, the Lord made the same requirement. A lamb for its household must be slain. The same for the high priest. On the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, if you approach me, you will die. Except, when you bring a sin offering made of a bull that is killed. Are you, are you getting the picture? Nobody can approach God unless He brings blood. So what are you bringing to the Lord? 
for your salvation. Your list of prayers, your good works, the properties that you donate for a chapel to be built. What? Land titles? Bank accounts? They are all missing the point. There's only one offering that the Lord will respect. The blood. The blood of the sacrificial lamb. Yeshua is the fulfillment of the animal sacrifice system. Yeshua, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood. He suffered outside the gate. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. Only the blood. This is the first lesson tonight. I am hammering this like a broken record. There is no salvation outside of the blood. Church doesn't count for anything. Knowledge doesn't count for anything. Your pedigree, your relationship, what you did, how much money you have, zero value, absolutely no value, no value whatsoever. Only through the blood. We have redemption through His blood. I said, my Lord, you know, and He said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. There is no relationship with God in a new covenant way without the blood. We can go through all the seminars and all the teachings and join all the organizations that are religious. Apart from the blood, we have no covenant with God. The covenant is because of the blood. In fact, we must, quote-unquote, drink of this blood. Yeshua said, Matthew 26, 27, 28. When he had taken a cup, give thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Even intercession is through his blood. Christ appeared as high priest. He entered to the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, because he did not enter with the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. Nobody can enter the tabernacle without a blood offering. The one in heaven, the perfect tabernacle, only one blood is accepted. The blood of Yeshua. Peace and power to make us work his perfect goodwill is through his blood. Look at this. Hebrews 13.20 The God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant even Jesus our Lord make you perfect in every good work to do His will. Even the doing of good work is by His blood. There is no good work as aside and apart from the blood of the eternal covenant. Nobody escapes the blood. If you have other ways of salvation other than the blood of Yeshua I tell you tonight Better check your faith. Better be sure that you are standing on the blood of Yeshua. We are purchased with His own blood. His blood sanctifies us. The sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Yeshua and be sprinkled with His blood. Sanctification. The, the, the work of straightening up our life. Making us the kind of persons we should be is by the power of the blood. The great assembly in heaven are those purchased by His blood. Purchased for God with your blood from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. About the break of... Always by the blood. There is nothing in heaven that is not purchased by the blood. Justification, forgiveness, salvation from wrath is always through the blood. Much more than having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. What is the saving from the wrath of God? Is by His blood. So you ask, you ask a person, uh, sister, brother, primo, prima, wala taman ginapangayo, we do not ask it, but if you die tonight, where will your soul go? Ah, in heaven eh? Why? Why? Because I'm not really bad. I, I have faults, but I'm not that bad. Okay. 
So, because of that, you will go to heaven? Of course. Eh? I hope. Okay. What else? Well, I pray. Okay. And other people pray for me. Okay. And when I die, more people will pray for me. Okay. The whole investigation never mentioned the blood. I am sorry to report to you. You will never make it there. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Always the blood. Overcoming Satan is by his blood. How can we have victory over Satan? Because of the blood. I terrific. Uh, in, my, in my prayer time, prayer, prayer life with Anne, I plead the blood over my day, my hour, my minute, Lord. I plead the blood over my law office, my cases, Lord. I plead the blood of the Lamb to overcome satanic opposition. Satanic opposition. The work that we do, I always pray, Lord, I plead the blood of the Lamb against the opposition. Because that's the word. We overcome Him by the blood of the Lamb. Reconciliation is through His blood. Through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Terrific. What on earth, what on earth, what good thing on earth can ever come to us apart from the blood? How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Many of us tonight, before we end, we will play, pray for cleansing of memories and cleansing of conscience. Because we are still being eaten up by memories of past sins. How can that be cleansed? Only by the blood. Nothing else can cleanse memories. Not, there is no detergent or cleaner. No joy or no dishwashing thing can cleanse conscience or memories. Only the blood of Christ. Only the blood of Christ. We are brought near to God through His blood. You want to be near? We want to be near to God? You who are formerly were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Wala agad yan. Hindi kayo iskapo yan sa dugo yan ni Cristo. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. The blood. Somebody made a list of the great themes of Christianity. They are all connected to the blood. I'll just give a rundown because we are running out of time. Covering is through the blood. Redemption is by the blood. Reconciliation is through the blood. Cleansing. Sanctification. We are cleansed by the blood to serve the living God. Dwelling in the holiest is through the blood. Life, living, is in the blood. Even, even health, when you plead the DNA of the blood of Yeshua in the human system for health, is through the blood. Victory is through the blood. Heavenly joy is through the blood. I grab it. All this list, everything is connected. Every good thing in human life that can be experienced as blessing is always by the blood. By the blood. By the blood. I listed them all down. It's all there. It's by the blood. If we fall away, we are crucifying again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. May we not fall away. Hebrews chapter 6. That is why there is a drinking unworthily when we partake of the Lord's Supper of Holy or Holy Communion. We do not give due respect to the blood. That is why many among you are sick and some even have died, are dead, because of disrespect for the blood. We do not respect the blood. Sometimes we come to the blood and we have anger and resentment. Better not to partake. How can we keep on the irritation and anger for a brother or sister and partake of the Lord's Supper when that blood is forgiving us and we are not willing to forgive the one that we encountered two hours before we came to the Holy Communion. So, the disrespect for the blood is creating disease and sickness. 
better not partake if we are not spiritually, emotionally ready. Our eternal security is in His blood because those who have received the benefit of the blood, they are written in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Why is the blood the basis for our salvation? Because the life of the creature is in the blood. Levit Leviticus 17.11 It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Can other people help in saving us? Are there other helping saviors? Very simple question. I hope we settle it tonight. There can never be other saviors because only Yeshua shed His blood. Only Yeshua has perfect sinless blood. There's no other Savior. He knew no sin and He became a sin offering for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That is why may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The cross is a symbol of shame. But that is where Yeshua shed His blood. I believe in the symbolism of the cross. The Apostle Paul is proud of the cross because it is connected with the blood. It was on the cross that the blood was shed. So, whether the Romans are ashamed of that or the Jews are embarrassed with the cross, I will stand with the cross of Yeshua because that is where He shed His blood. This is Salvation 001. Salvation is by the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lamb that was slain, who died on the cross for you and me. As we close this, how do we appropriate or receive the benefit of the blood? The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message, we must receive the message of the cross where Jesus shed His blood. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 15. I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you stand. First you receive. Then you stand. What is that? The thing of first importance is that Christ died for our sins. He shed His blood. That is of first importance. That is where we begin with the doctrine of salvation, the shedding of the blood. All the others, redemption, sanctification, good health, peace, cannot follow without the shedding of the blood. How about the Torah? Because we teach here the Torah. I want to settle this issue about the Torah in relation to the blood. Romans 3. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. By the works of Torah, this is Scripture 1998, I'm quoting. By works of Torah, no flesh shall be declared right before Him. For by the Torah is the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the Torah, a righteousness of Elohim has been revealed. Being witnessed by the Torah. The Torah only witnesses to salvation apart from the Torah. Not because of the Torah, but look at how it ends. Very beautiful. The righteousness of Elohim is through belief or faith in Messiah to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory or esteem of Elohim. Being declared right without paying by His favor through the redemption which is in Messiah, Yeshua Mashiach, whom Elohim set forth as an atonement through faith in His blood. It's not the Torah that saves. It is the blood of the Yeshua Mashiach that saves. The Torah points to the Yeshua, but the Torah can never save anybody. Let's be very clear on that. The Torah is never the Savior. Yeshua is the Savior. The job of the Torah is to make clear the Savior, to point to the Savior. 
For we reckon that a man is declared right by faith without the works of the Torah. And that is why the Apostle Paul ends, Do we then nullify the Torah through faith? Let it not be. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. We strengthen the Torah. Because the purpose of the Torah is to lead us to Christ. Amen. If we all go to the Torah and forget about Christ and His plan, we are gunners. We are really lost. The Torah is to lead us to the blood of Christ. So how do we show that we have faith in His blood? First, confess. This is how we will end tonight. I will ask some of you to just say a prayer with me and that is our conf confession. But Messiah is the goal of the Torah. Remember this Romans 10. Remember this verse. Romans 10 for Messiah is the goal objective, distinct destination of the Torah unto righteousness to everyone who believes. Moshe writes about the righteousness which is the Torah. The man who does this shall live by them. This righteousness or faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who shall ascend into the heavens? That is to bring beside them. Who shall descend into the abyss? That is to bring beside them from the dead. In other words, if you are led by the Torah, you do not talk about, where is the Messiah? Where can I find him? If you know the Torah, this is what you confess. You confess with your mouth, Yeshua as Lord, and believe in your heart that Elohim has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. That is the effect of the Torah. When you read the Torah, you know that there's nobody else who is the Lamb except Yeshua. You do not ask anymore, I'm waiting for the Messiah to come. Tapos na, He has already come. If we understand the Torah, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. But there's a second way, and I will really ask many of you tonight, please consider the issue of baptism. Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Yeshua for the remission of sins. Why? Is this an addition to, I will, the, the Bible will explain this by itself. And some of you, I don't know if you have ever been baptized the way the scriptures want baptism to be baptized. Matthew chapter 3, the Lord went to John. He said, baptize me. John said, how can that be? I'm just your servant, you're the boss. Yeshua said, this is the way to fulfill all righteousness. Even the Savior went to baptism. What kind of baptism? By immersion. He came up immediately from the water. That means he went into the water and rose up from the water. The only way to do that is to be immersed. Sprinkling is okay if the purpose is dedication or giving you a name. But you want dead serious business with the Lord, be baptized by immersion. What is the connection of baptism by immersion to Salvation. Here it is. There is an explanation. If we are truly sincere, like the Ethiopian eunuch, he believed Philip, Acts 8, 35 to 38. He understood about Yeshua. This is the conversation that happened next. Here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe in your heart, then you may be baptized. And he answered, I believe that Yeshua is the Son of God. Then therefore he was baptized. If you are sincere that Yeshua is the one who shed his blood for me, then be baptized. It's like wedding and being in love. Are you really in love with this fiancé? Then go and marry her in a public... You cannot just say, oh I love you, so will you marry me? Oh, oh I'll think about it. The public display and announcement of faith in the Messiah is being baptized. I know of a brother in the Lord, he has been baptized in water 
three times because he said my first two I was just compelled. I did not really mean it. I want to do it again. Maybe some of us we have been baptized as Protestants or whatever. Protestantism cannot say. Believing and being baptized. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And when he believed, he was baptized, he and all his household, straightway. The word there is immediately. Now what is the connection between believing and being baptized? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Yeshua Messiah, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into his death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we have been planted together in the likeness of the dead. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. What is the operative prophetic act that identifies us with the death and resurrection of Yeshua? Baptism. So that is why this is the symbolism. We are buried with Christ and we rise with Him in resurrection. This is how they do it. Paul explains, by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. As many as you have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. You want to put on Christ the garment of the skin of righteousness which you believe and confess. Of course, you believe and confess, but you want to announce it, be boldly declaring it, then be baptized. Put on Christ. How can we who died to sins deliver it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Baptism identifies with the shedding of the blood in His death. That is why if we are really serious with our faith, we better be baptized. All these other passages show Yeshua's blood was poured out for remission of sins. Baptism is also for remission of sins, symbolizing the faith. The Gospel says that whoever believes and is baptized, they are saved. Baptism is the declaration of the faith in the blood of Yeshua. Third way, by which we partake of the blood. Maybe in Nehoff, we should do this more often, the Holy Communion. Yeshua said, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body, this is my blood. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, the Lord's blood, until He comes. This is the foundation of everything, the blood of the Lamb. There are things that accompany salvation, but the foundation is the blood of the Lamb. All doctrine of salvation, apart from the blood, is useless. Nothing. The only reason why we stand here is because of the blood 